What I want to do today is to kind of uh, give you a general introduction to geology, um, but more specifically what we would call creation geology. I, I emphasize this because, again, uh, the science that's being taught today is a science that's based on atheism. Now, not all scientists are atheists. I wouldn't say that, uh, but the majority are. St statistics have shown that the majority of, of your practicing scientists today are atheists. Um, the number may be less than is indicated, just out of fear, because today, I mean, uh, professing belief in the Bible, profess professing belief in the creation itself would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, would just be devastating to your career, either in academia as a scientist or in, a, in an industry of pos position. But uh, the, the science that's being taught today, the science that's being taught in public schools, is almost certainly a science that's based on atheism. They've rejected the existence of God, rejected the Bible as being a source for truth, and uh, believe that all of this came about through purely natural processes. Uh, this atheistic worldview uh, creates a philosophical position known as naturalism. And this is the position that take, is taken by science today, is the position of naturalism. They argue that, uh, that all physical phenomena occurs through purely natural processes, and the origin of everything we see has come into existence through purely natural processes. This is the position that the scientific community has taken. And this is why our science museums today are called natural history museums. They're the history of the world from natural processes. The natural, they call them natural history museums. That's why we call a, a, a synonym going back for more than a century of a scientist is what they, what they call a naturalist. For the same reason. Uh, the, the reason why we call the world out there nature is because it's believed to have come about through purely natural processes. This is the position that the scientific community has taken. But I argue that in, for much of... Uh, I want, I, we want to ask ourselves in general, though, is, is it possible to interpret a world with the supernatural history through rigid naturalism? Scientists are trying to explain how our world came to be through purely natural processes, but we know from the Bible that God spoke the universe into existence. I mean, how are you going to explain the origin of something that an almighty God spoke into existence? I mean, there's some aspects of the creation can never be understood within the boundaries of naturalism. And one of those particular events is the, is the global flood, which are, is kind of the focus of our talk tonight. I, I argue that it's impossible to correctly interpret the geology of the biblical flood through rigid naturalism. I mean, you would think they could. Um, geologists know a lot about geologic processes, about how things erode, how about erosion and sediment deposition. We're going to talk a lot about this stuff. You'd figure they could because they're really smart and they know a lot about geologic processes, but I argue that they can't, that it's impossible for naturalists to correctly interpret uh, the geology of this event. We've got to remember that this was a, uh, a global scale event, global scale event. Um, Genesis 6 through 9 records the uh, details of the, of the flood of Noah. And the waters prevailed so mightily upon the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth. Birds, cattle, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm upon the earth, and every man. Everything on dry land in whose nostrils were the breath of life died. This was a global scale, all-encompassing event. All the high mountains were covered, everything on dry land and whose nostrils of the breath of life died, and every man. This was a, a terrible and global scale event. And I, I'd argue, you know, what, what would we expect to see if an event like this was real and global in scale other than what we see? We live on a flood wasteland. I mean... Some of the best places to see this are in states where uh, there's little vegetation. You go down through Utah and, uh, you know, some of these areas where ve vegetation hasn't, uh, you know, it doesn't completely cover the ground. And, and uh, I was, happened to watch a program the other night on PBS that was doing flybys over uh, Utah and, uh, and uh, Arizona, some of these uh, um, flood. And, and that's what you see when you, when, you, when you look at these areas from the airplane. It's so obvious. It's what we live on. We live on a flood wasteland. That's what, the, that's what this world is. And again, you would think that a geologist could recognize it. If there had been a global flood, as the one described in the Bible, you would think that a geologist would be able to recognize this to be the case. But I argue that it's impossible because of the supernatural intervention that was involved in this event. And it's this piece right here. 
God told Noah there was going to be a flood. Told, it told him how to, how to make an ark that would allow him to survive this event along with all the animals that came to Noah. The, it specifically says the animals will come to you to be kept alive. The only reason life exists today on top of these vast layers of flood deposits that cover the entire world is because they were saved from this event through an act of supernatural intervention. This supernatural connection with this event precludes or prevents a naturalist from correctly interpreting the event. We live in a world that's covered in monumental layers of flood deposit, but life exists on top of those vast layers of rocks. How is a geologist rigidly bound in naturalism going to make sense of that? It's impossible. How can, they make, how can you make sense of, of a world as it now exists? It's impossible. So be skeptical about their interpretations of geology. I would argue if, there's been, if there has been a global flood, as the one described in the Bible, then one thing is certain. The geology of that event has been misinterpreted. Big time. Okay. With uh, When this philosophical view of naturalism is applied to geology, as it has been, this birthed what we call uniformitarianism. Around 1850, this view called uniformitarianism finally really started to take shape, which argued that slow and gradual processes with uniform rates of int and, and, and intensities were responsible for Earth's geologic features like fossiliferous rock and erosion. This view became known as uniformitarianism. However, prior to the 19th century, it was largely assumed by geologists that catastrophes, most uh, importantly, the biblical flood, was responsible for the majority of these uh, features. The concept of uniformitarianism was ushered in by two champions uh, of geology, one of them uh, shown here, James Hutton, and another by the name of Charles Lyell. I will introduce you to in just a second. James Hutton was an anti-catastrophist. Prior to ushering in this view, the vast majority of peoples assumed there had been a global flood. At least peoples that lived in areas with access to the Bible assumed that the layers of rocks that they saw, that the fossils they found, were those that were formed by the global flood. So he was an anti-catastrophist who argued in his 1875 book titled The Theory of the Earth for Uniformity of Causes to Explain the Earth's Geologic Features. He asserted that sedimentary rocks are the result of cyclic processes of erosion and sediment deposition, processes that he argued do not change over time. He summarized this with his famous phrase, no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. With this in mind, listen to this prophecy from 1st, 2nd Peter 3, 3 through 6 in total. Know this. First of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. This is exactly what uniformitarian geology argues, that geologic processes have not changed over time. All things continue as it was from the beginning. Now let's read on. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens, heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was deluged, being flooded with water. This is the world that we live in. This prophecy is coming to fruition as we speak. This is what geologists hold to, that all things continue as they were from the beginning. Cyclic processes of sediment deposition, uplift, and erosion have been continuous throughout the history of life on earth and are responsible for the vast layers of, of rocks that we see. In 1830, Charles Lyell argued in his book titled Principles of Geology for Uniformity of Intensity. He asserted that the same gradual processes occurring today were responsible for all geologic features. He, his famous uh, his quote was that the present is the key to the past. He argued that the same process we see happening today are responsible for all geologic features. Uh, Charles Lyell influenced Char uh, Charles Darwin heavily. They were, uh, they were contemporaries living at the same time, communicated regularly. Char it was I said that Charles Darwin had a copy of Lyell's book with him when he took his famous voyage out to, the H on, uh, out to the Galapagos Islands. And it is said that Charles Lyell actually met him when he returned. 
They were close friends and were in constant communication. And Charles Darwin's views about the age of the earth were largely um, due to the teachings of uh, Charles Lyell. These two views, catastrophism versus uniformitarianism, can be debated any time we look at uh, uh, geologic features like those that you see here in Monument Valley, Utah. All of the rock that you see here is sandstone, a type of a sedimentary rock. We'll talk a little bit more about that. This is a, but keep this, this is a new rock. The, the sand that's in this area was transported to this area. Particles uh, weathered of other, other ancient basement rocks weathered away into smaller particles. Those particles were transported by the actions of fluids and deposited in this location. Originally, they were deposited as high as the monuments are today forming a vast floodplain of sedimentary deposits. So something transported these sediments there and deposited them there, forming a vast floodplain, and then something eroded away all the material that's now missing. So whether this was through uniform rates of erosion and deposition, or whether this was catastrophically uh, done is, uh, is the debate. A um, little bit hard to explain where all the missing sand is without some kind of a catastrophic sweep away. Let me take a diverge for, for just a moment because so I want to read you something out of a, of a book that I was assigned when I took a, a geology in college. When I was at Texas Tech, we were, uh, we were assigned this book, Taking Geology. And, and uh, I mean, I, I grew up in the church and have always known about the global flood. Growing up from growing up as a kid, I always knew about the global flood. And, and growing up in New Mexico, I interpreted the geology that I saw as having come about through the flood of Noah. In uh, New Mexico, you have vast salt flats and uh, um, the cliff faces that you see had rings on them that, I, that to me, they look like recession rings. Oh, look, at that's where the water receded, you know, down these, and right outside Roswell, where I grew up, there were, there were saltwater lakes. There's a series of saltwater lakes called uh, uh, Bottomless Lake State Park. And uh, then you got uh, enormous caverns in New Mexico and a huge uh, deposit of pure white sand called uh, uh, the White Sands uh, National Monument. A 200 square mile deposit of pure white gypsum. Literally dunes 50 feet high, just out in the middle of nowhere. Big 200 square mile deposit of pure white gypsum. Anyway, there was some interesting geology in uh, New Mexico. And I always interpreted this as, at the, when I saw it, I interpreted it uh, based on the, my understanding that there had been a global flood. But that's what scientists do. This is what uh, everyone interprets the world around them from their worldview. And informed as we are by the historical event of the global flood, we can make sense of the geology that's around us. And scientists that have rejected the Bible and don't believe in creation, we can't really fault them for interpreting it differently. I mean, they're trying to make sense of the world. Everyone has to make sense of the world. You'd go crazy if you, you could not. But uh, in my opinion, you can't get to the truth without the Bible, and particularly with regard to geology. <clears throat> Nonetheless, I took this class assuming I knew about the global flood and I, I knew that they weren't going to be teaching us about the global flood, but I assumed that I was going to be hearing a lot of evidence for it in this class, which I did. I mean, pointed out lots of catastrophic related geology that I didn't know about from this class. But one of the things that kind of surprised me was, uh, was all the references to the biblical flood. There's tons of references to the biblical flood. The book, start, the book they assigned us starts off with an attack on catastrophism on the original interpretation of geology, because they've been fighting against it ever since. And every, all these, I don't know if you can see all those yellow, yellow tabs, all those yellow tabs in the first two or three chapters were references to the biblical flood in one form or another in this book. You made an up, up, coming up, up front attack on the biblical flood. Nonetheless, catastrophism versus uniformitarianism. They say, ancient peoples were uh, quite understandably or were impressed only by rapid and violent geological processes. This led to a catastrophic view of the earth, commonly called catastrophism, which dominated European thought until 1850. Changes were thought to occur suddenly, rapidly, and devastatingly by a series of catastrophes. The most famous example of such a supposed catastrophe was, of course, the great deluge of the Old Testament. <clears throat> When geology emerged as a vigorous intellectual pursuit around 1800, an alternative concept of earth change began to develop. It was now argued that the same common processes observed operating today were largely responsible for all past changes imprinted in the rock record. 
a non-catastrophic or more uniform view of change thus emerged, which provided no role for unknown, miraculous, or supernatural processes. No role for miraculous or supernatural processes. Unfortunately, you cannot interpret the geology correctly without it. Because again, what a geologist is doing, they're not just trying to interpret the world as we now see it, covered in these vast monumental bodies of sedimentary rock, but you have to explain how that sedimentary rock got there with life that still exists today. Because running around on top of those vast layers of rocks are lots of little fragile creatures. You got cold-blooded animals that couldn't can't survive changes in temperatures, amphibians that can't survive exposure to salt waters, lots of little butterflies and things, fragile organisms are alive today that could simply not survive an event capable of laying down such monumental deposits. But there they are. It creates an inexplicable situation for a naturalist. You, they cannot interpret the world as, we, as it now exists because life only exists due to this act of supernatural intervention. How else can they explain it? Oh, those layers were due to some massive catastrophic flood, but, and that covers, those sediments cover the entire planet, but life, somehow life miraculously is still here. It's crazy. Well, because of this, geologists have been highly biased against catastrophism, highly biased against catastrophism. And this is best uh, illustrated by the story of Harlan Bretz. Harlan Bretz was a geologist here in Washington State, and in the 1920s, he proposed that eastern Washington had been destroyed by a major catastrophic flood. And he named this area of eastern Washington the Channeled Scablands, because out in eastern Washington, you find these massive channels cut into the ground, cut deeply into the ground through hard volcanic rock. This entire area is covered in massive layers of uh, volcanic rock. The walls of this canyon are solid volcanic rock. But these, can these uh, canyons are gorgeous, have been cut into this. And some of them vast in size. Massive geologic features like the one you see here. This is called a coulee. The Grand Coulee reaches at its maximum four miles wide and 900 feet deep. Now, this was one of Harlan Bretz's main examples. He argued that these coolies could not have been formed unless they were full of water at one point in time because the bottoms are really super flat and, and the walls are very straight. He argued the only way a formation like this could form is if it was full of water at one point in time, that it was completely full of water at one point in time. But again, this thing is at its, at its widest, four miles wide, 900 feet deep. The entire thing completely full of water at one point in time, inconceivable. This is a region that sees very little rainfall today. But Harlan Bretz argued it was all of these features were the result of a catastrophic flood. This map gives you a, a good indication of how much water would have been necessary. You see the, the span of, of, uh, of the land that's involved here between Wenatchee and Spokane. Everything in blue there was, was what would have been underwater at one point in time during this flood. The darker blues, if you can make those out, are where water is today. You can even see these, uh, these channels, these gorges and uh, canyons from satellite photos. This is a satellite photo. You can see the dark lines cut into it. This is where the channels are today. Well, Harlan Brents, for the proposal, found himself ostracized by the scientific community. Ostracized. Because they've been fighting against catastrophism since the mid-1800s. And here comes this guy in the 1920s talking about catastrophic floods. That sounds a little bit too close to biblical kind of stuff. Can't talk about floods to explain geology today. This is an article from the Seattle Times, 2003. <clears throat> Mystified by the forces that could have exposed such massive features, Brett set out in the early 1920s to solve the riddle. He returned with a hypothesis that was dismissed as near lunacy, craziness. In a region that sees less moisture in a year than Seattle gets in a month, Brett's concluded that the entire landscape was carved by water. Bretz, according to some reports, was quickly isolated as a crank, a crazy person, while his critics' theories continue to make it into textbooks. Fifty years later, <clears throat> Bretz was hailed as a hero, and in 1979, at the age of 96, he was given geology's highest honor, the Penrose Medal, which rewards one researcher each year for exceptional contributions to, to geology. Two years later, he passed away. 
He was ostracized by the geological community for 50 years and finally hailed as a hero two years before he passed away. We now know, because obviously he was eventually recognized for this, that eastern Washington was destroyed by a major, major catastrophic flood. It's today called the Missoula Flood. And this, uh, this map gives you, a, gives you a pretty good idea what happened. Um, the floodwaters are believed to have come from a large Ice Age lake that is centered around what is today Missoula, Montana, thus its name. But the, the lake itself was building higher and higher due to the melting of glacial waters and was unable to run off. There wasn't either, there, they argue that an ice dam was keeping it in place. We believe that the Ice Age was caused by the global flood. And after the global flood, there were no drainage systems yet. The continents would have been vast flood plains without significant drainage systems, and it's just possible this lake did not have a drainage system, an outlet for it to the, to the ocean yet. But it is said that it was held in place by an ice dam, and at some point that ice dam breached, and the entire body of water contained within the Missoula flood, 3,000 square miles, 2,000 feet deep lake, um, plowed its way across eastern Washington in, uh, in a couple of days. It carved out the Columbia River Gorge. If you've ever been stopped in one overlook of the Columbia River Gorge, you know the mass, the size that you're talking about here. And it formed features that only from the airplane were recognizable as flood features, like the rolling hills that you see here outside of Spokane are 30 feet high, 250 feet apart from the ground. They just look, they're just hills. But from the airplane, a symmetry became apparent and it, they finally recognized, and in fact, much of the area was, uh, was they only finally came around and, and acknowledged Hart and Brett's after viewing the area there from the airplane sufficiently. The rolling hills around Spokane, they then recognized to be uh, ripple marks. They were features that are gigantic in scale. Things they saw on much smaller scale, they were able to finally recognize once they saw them from an airplane, but... It was seeing the, the area from an airplane that finally convinced them. It hauled massive boulders. In fact, huge gravel bars around uh, uh, the Willamette Valley are due to the Missoula flood. It, it deposited mass, mass monumental amounts of uh, gravel in the area, as well as huge boulders called erratics. This is uh, from the Erratic Rock State Natural Site in the Willamette Valley, Oregon. The rocks that you see there are, were carried there from the Missoula flood. Flood water is so powerful, so much force behind them, they were carried, uh, carried huge boulders along with them. Portland during the flood was, would have been completely underwater. Um, some estimated it, it was 400 feet deep. Portland would have been 400 feet underwater, uh, or the flood waters were over 400 feet deep at this location and traveling at 90 miles per hour. It is estimated that they were equal to uh, 10 times what is found in all the Earth's rivers today. That's a monumental flood. It formed, uh, during this flood, there would have been a huge waterfall at this location. This is, there's a state park <clears throat> out in eastern Washington, <clears throat> excuse me, called Dry Fall State Park, that, uh, where you can stop in an overlook and look at the remnants of what was a massive waterfall. There's an artist's conception on the railing just at one of these overlooks that gives you an idea of what the waterfall would have looked like. But uh, uh, this is a really massive geologic feature, not well captured by photographs. So I, I took a video out there when I was uh, there uh, a few years ago to try to give a little better, um, get better idea of what you're looking at here. And this is a massive, massive waterfall. It, the, uh, the, it is estimated that it was, it's close to three and a half miles wide with a drop of 400 feet. By comparison, Niagara Falls is one mile wide and drops 165 feet. So this is three times the size of Niagara Falls. Um, as I pan to the right, what you'll see is the Grand Coulee. The picture that I showed you previously, the Grand Coulee, the Grand Coulee actually exists on both sides of Dry Falls. There's an upper and lower portion. But that's, the grand, that's what I showed you in the photograph board. That's Grand Coulee. Massive, massive canyon that was formed by uh, this flood. The Dry Falls Visitor Center was dedicated to Hardin Brett's in 1994. The plaque uh, there can be found just outside the facility. It reads, uh, dedicated to Hardin Brett's, who patiently taught us that catastrophic floods may sometimes play a role in nature's unfolding drama. And there's a quote there from, from Brett's. He said, 
Ideas without precedent are generally looked upon with disfavor, and men are shocked if their conceptions of an orderly world are challenged. With such bias influencing the interpretations of geologists, today it's, uh, um, it is assumable that all geologic features formed during the global flood would be misinterpreted. And... Uh, um, and it would have been argued that they have formed through other mechanisms than a catastrophic flood. This is assumable. So with this in mind, we're going to kind of take a t tour of some geologic features, and I'll try to, uh, as best I can, argue for a different interpretation. That is, that what you're looking at by way of these geologic features is, in fact, a, a monument to the devastating flood brought, brought about by God for the judgment of the people on the earth in those days. Sedimentary rocks are a key part of geology today. Sedimentary rocks form when sediments, uh, these are just eroded particles that are suspended in fluids, settle out of the fluid and then harden into a rock. There are three main types of sedimentary rocks. Uh, sandstone, which is made up of sand particles, uh, shown here at Arches National Park. Shale is another type that is made up of finer particles of silt and clay. And then you have limestone. Limestone is a sedimentary rock composed of uh, calcium carbonate or hardened by calcium carbonate from the invertebrate, exos from invertebrate exos exoskeleton debris. So it has been, it's a rock that's been cemented together by calcium carbonate. That's coming from uh, exos the exoskeletons of uh, vast invertebrates. Pretty much all of them have calcium carbonate as part of their shell. In most places, sedimentary rocks are hundreds of feet thick. In places, they reach kilometers of thickness. Uh, and so vast and monumental are these sedimentary rocks that they have been used as building materials since the flood. The pyramids, at, as you see here at Giza, uh, as well as the Sphinx, were, were entirely made out of limestone. Uh, the, if you've ever been to uh, Israel, the, uh, in Jerusalem, all of the stones that you see there in Jerusalem are uh, it's what they call a Jerusalem limestone. All the pavement stones there and uh, the stones that were made to build the walls, the retaining walls and all, that's all limestone. Massive amounts of sedimentary rock exist. It uh, is a powerful and monumental body of evidence to support a major global scale catastrophe. These, uh, this sedimentary rock exists in distinct layers that is called strata. Now, geologists generally view these various layers of rocks as forming in different depositional environments. Meaning, so when something de is deposited, so there's different kind of environments that these sediments could form in. It can be a desert, or it can be a lake, or it can be a swamp, or it can be an ocean can came in and inundate. But, and these various layers are believed to be due to a changing depositional environment. It was a desert there for a while, then the ocean came in and flooded and deposited some limestone on top of that desert sand, and then the ocean receded and it was a swamp for a period of time producing silt, and then maybe a sand some sand was deposited later. This is their interpretation of the layers of rocks, like you see here in the Grand Canyon. It is this uh, fossiliferous or fossil-containing strata that is referred to as a fossil record. Um, because the layers are, it's called a fossil record because these layers are believed to be a recording of periods of time. Much like tree rings or ice cores uh, have layers that can that, uh, record a sequence of events, these layers of rocks are, are recording a, a sequence of events as well and are thought to be chronologically distinct from one another. Therefore, the fossils found in these layers of rocks are interpreted as being separated by vast eons of time and representative of the life on earth over what is called geologic time. The sorting of fossils, the fact that the fossils are, are uh, they, there are typically what you find are certain fossils below or above other fossils. And to, a, uh, to an evolutionist, this is proof that life on earth has changed over time and has changed from simple to complex forms. Um, when it was realized that fossils were sorted, this was a great source of confusion to many Christians, many Bible believers who had previously assumed that what they were looking at was a result of a global flood. When, they, when geologists started illustrating that fossils are often found below or above other fossils, and they argued that what you were looking at was a, a, a the history of life on earth represented in rock layers, this was a great source of confusion. Because I, I guess they believed that uh, from a global flood, all the fossils would be just all found jumbled together in one great big mass. But we got to remember that the flood itself lasted an extended period of time, a full five months. The flood lasted 
from the 17th day of the second month of Noah's life to the 17th day of the seventh month of Noah's life. That's how long it took before the flood reached its climactic height. And, and the last animals died as close to five months after the beginning of the flood. The flood was an extended event. And we believe that what we're looking at by way of the fossil record is just the destruction of successive life zones, destruction of successive habitats. Different communities of organisms live at different elevations. They, <clears throat> your different habitats or biomes on Earth are largely due to two, different, two main abiotic factors. Temperature and water. The amount, of the amount of water in an area and the temperature of that area largely determines the communities of plants and animals that will live there. And the temperature and, and amount of water is heavily influenced by elevation. So these different habitats generally are co correlate by elevation. And we believe that what you're looking at there is just the destruction of successive habitats during the flood. <clears throat> That's all it is. Now, but unknown to many, the fossil record, like you see here in this diagram, um, which is more formally called the geological column, was actually assembled by correlating layers of strata for many different locations. Um, it is said that the entire fossil record doesn't exist except maybe on less than 1% of the Earth's surface. Just a little piece of it exists here, and a little piece of it over there. But I'll show you what they did. This is a graphic uh, that was made by the U.S. Geologic Survey to illustrate this point. Um, by correlating layers that are exposed in different areas, they eventually came up with the entire fossil record, or what we call the geological column. So for example, um, the, the Kaibab limestone, I don't know how well you can see this diagram, the Kaibab limestone that I've circled there can be found close to the top of the Grand Canyon, um, but on the bottom of the exposed layers at Zion National Park in Utah. Uh, the Navajo sandstone that I've circled here and some other formations can be found both at Zion National Park and Canyonlands National Park there in Utah. The Morrison Formation circled there, which is rich in dinosaur fossils. The Morrison Formation is a dinosaur graveyard, massive, literally thousands of dinosaur fossils can be found in the Morrison Formation. Uh, it can be found at both Canyonlands and Mesa Verde. The Curtis Formation, the Entrada Sandstone, can be found in both Mesa Verde and Bryce Canyon. By comparing these layers at various locations, they eventually put together what they believe is the view of the history of life on Earth represented by these fossil layers. <clears throat> All the layers, again, of the, of the fossil record, though, are said to be found in much less than 1% of the Earth's surface. And this is well illustrated by this map, also made from the U.S. Geologic Survey. Now, I didn't uh, uh, point out the names to you of that various names of these geologic periods, but you can see them on this map of the Jurassic period, the Triassic period, the Permian period. These are periods of time, geologic time. And these are color-coded for you to show which periods are on the surface in North America. Now, one of the things I want you to note on this diagram, take a look at where the reds are on the map and take a look at where the reds are on the scale on the right. So all of this area up in northern Canada where you see reds, look at, the, look at, the, look at the, now the scale of geologic periods. All of those geologic periods above the reds are all missing from that entire region. The entire fossil record cannot be found except in a few places. They say even like less than 1% of the Earth's surface might contain the entirety of this uh, geologic record, but the reality is you only see a piece of it here or there. But that, it, that it's missing from that entire area of Canada is very telling. There's something else I want to point out while I have this map up, and that's this. Remember the reason why they couldn't recognize the Missoula flood, the reason why they couldn't recognize that eastern Washington was destroyed by a major flood is because it was too big. The geologic formations out there were too large for them to recognize that they were catastrophic formations until they viewed them from the airplane. But if they can't, couldn't recognize that the Missoula flood was a result of a catastrophic flood, how are they going to recognize that something like this is the result of a catastrophic flood? I mean, they're so far from the truth in this matter that uh, it's, just, it's ridiculous. There's something else I want to show you. I had actually used this map for years uh, in, in a talk on, ge on, on fossils and geology like this. And then suddenly, like it was last year, in, uh, I, suddenly this map re uh, reminded me of something that I use in my biology classes. Um, 
when we're, start ta when we're talking about ecology, one of the things we get into are the different biomes. So uh, a type of habitat is what we call a biome. Like there's grasslands and you've got your coniferous forest and you've got your alpine meadows, the great grass, grasslands like the great plains we have in the United States. These are the various biomes. And at some point, having used this map for years, suddenly this map reminded me of a biome map, a map of the biomes that we see in North America. And so just to see, I, I did a quick search on Wikipedia and found a biome map of North America. And I want you to... Remember, if our interpretation is correct of the fossil record, what you're looking at is the destruction of successive habitats. And if that interpretation is correct, then you know, perhaps it will very closely match the present day habitats found in North America. So I found a map and there it is. That's a map of the various biomes that are present in North America. And just look how eerily similar these two maps are. I mean, you can see where some of the lines are just in the exact same place. The line that goes through the Great Lakes, for example. I mean, right? that's all you're looking at in the fossil record, really, is the destruction of successive habitats during the global flood. That's all you're looking at. Okay, let's uh, analyze strata formation. Okay, remember strata is just the fancy name for these layers of rocks that sediments are found in. Um, and remember, as we said before, uh, geologists generally view various layers of rocks at, as having formed in different depositional environments. So you had a desert there once, and then you had ocean came in and inundated and, and laid down limestone, or then it became a swamp for a period of time. That's the general interpretation. Um, but experimentally, we know that layers do not require vast periods of time, and they don't require changing in depositional environments to form. You, all you have to do is take a column of dirt like this and shake it up, and it will settle out into different layers automatically. Um, the, the different size of particles, the different mass of these particles, the different shapes of these particles, all three of those factors will affect the rate at which they settle out, cause them to settle out at different rates, and you have different layers forming automatically. And I want to illustrate this for you a little bit better. Now, so in in uh, 1669, uh, Nicholas Steno, shown here, outlined the principles of stratigraphy, strata formation, the principles of strata formation, uh, which are now more commonly called the laws of stratigraphy. These include, number one, the principle of, a, of a lateral continuity. It is believed that... That uh, originally, this, stra this strata that we find on the Earth extended in all directions until it either thinned at the continental shelf, at the ocean, or was truncated by another geographical barrier like a mountain range. It is believed that all the strata was laterally continuous or horizontally indefinite. This law of stratigraphy is due to the observation that the layers of sedimentary rocks that are exposed in places like the Grand Canyon, etc., can be traced for hundreds and in, in some thousands of miles. The grand staircase that you see here is an immense sequence of sedimentary rocks, layers that stretch from Bryce Canyon through Zion National Park and into the Grand Canyon. These layers are laterally continuous or horizontally indefinite. It's a monument to a devastating catastrophe, and it seems so obvious to, uh, to us. Um, his other, uh, uh, Steno's other principles of uh, stratigraphy were the principle of superposition, that old, the oldest strata lies beneath younger strata, that the layers that you see here are oldest to youngest. Older one has to be on the bottom before a, younger, a newer one can be laid above it. This, this makes great, perfect sense. And also the principle of initial horizontality. Uh, because these sediments are drawn by gravity, it is argued that originally they were laid down horizontally. And this is important because many of them are not horizontal today. We can find a lot of them that are seriously bent and uplifted. But these, a simple demonstration can show that these laws are often not true. Look at this simple video. These, these light and dark particles that are being poured down not only form distinct layers at the exact same time, but the layers are not forming horizontally either. Particles of different densities or sizes or shapes will separate into layers when simply rolling downhill. There are a number of physical processes that will, that will suspend particles. And by just suspending particles for a brief moment, the different sizes of those particles, the different masses of those particles, the different shapes of those particles will allow them to settle out into, into distinct layers. 
Many physical processes can, will, will allow strata or layers of rocks to form quickly. And you, you are, we already know some of these, wind, river, you guys all, need, all know what some of these are. Uh, liquefaction and turbidity currents, I'll show you what those are. But let me show you mud flows. So most people don't realize just how significant mud flows are in being able to form distinct layers of strata. Mud flows are themselves terribly, uh, terribly damaging events. Uh, can cause massive erosion, um, very, very powerful erosion forces with mud flows. But they can form uh, strata instantly. What well, mud flow is basically a landslide that's just uh, in a slurry, uh, saturated by water and flowing down. This is actually a mud flow at Pinatubo. Um, but we had mud flows at Mount St. Helens. I'll show you some of the layers of rocks that were laid down by mud flows at Mount St. Helens as well. Those mud flows, not only powerful erosion forces, but uh, as this body of material is flowing, those particles are suspended. And that suspension gives them time to settle out at different rates. Uh, and in all mud flows, all landslides, form strata, form layers of rocks uh, that when you come back afterwards, you can see these layers of rocks. Liquefaction is another that is able to produce layers of rocks. Liquefaction occurs when uh, vibrations or, uh, or water pressure within a mass can cause soil particles to lose contact with one another, and then they behave like a liquid. Liquefaction is usually a very temporary thing and is, is often caused by earthquakes uh, vibrating water saturated uh, or water filled or unconsolidated soils leading to rapid stratification. When they come back into those soils later, they uh, find that it's all stratified. It doesn't take long. Any, uh, any physical process that's able to suspend particles will accomplish stratification of those materials. It doesn't take long periods of time and it doesn't take changing in depositional environments. Turbidity currents is another. Turbidity currents are underwater landslides. Um, here demonstrated in a laboratory flume, one of the uh, experimental m m uh, um, apparatuses that is used to explore both sedimentation, uh, a sedimentary deposit, how sedimentation occurs, as well as erosion. But uh, sediments uh, from, that form from turbidity currents form a particular type of sandstone called turbidites. And uh, turbidites have a very particular uh, characteristic that uh, allow them to be identified uh, as being due to a single flow. One of them is that they have a graded bedding. Um, the, within a specific bed of sandstone, the particles go from bigger particles to smaller particles. There's a grading to the bedding uh, so that they know it, was, it formed as a single bed. And uh, you'll tend to find uh, increasingly finer particles as you move upward. And, and, uh, but it is... These are just a couple of pictures of some turbidites found high up in the mountains. A, uh, a sand, the sandstone layer identified here at the Grand Canyon is a turbidite. And this layer, called the Tapete Sandstone, ranges in thickness from 125 to 325 feet thick. I mean, it's the smallest. It's 125 feet thick. Now, imagine the underwater landslide able to lay down a pasa that's 125 feet thick. Geologists have concluded that the Tapete sandstone was due to a series of underwater flows of sand racing along at upwards of 90 miles per hour. Such a, a devastating flow comprises a very highly energetic event that must have been caused by a, even a greater causal event. Scientists, in fact, estimate that about 30% of all the sedimentary rocks exposed at the Grand Canyon might, in fact, be turbidites. This map of the Tapete sandstone locations uh, in, across North America, based on some oil well drilling information, illustrates the extent of this deposit covering most of North America. At the base of the Tapete sandstone, it's noteworthy that uh, at the base of the Tapete sandstone layer is an, is an incredibly flat erosional surface from which all previously deposited material had been eroding away, leaving a very flat surface on which the Tapete sandstone was deposited. And uh, today, some geologists estimate that as many as 50% of the world's sedimentary rocks might, in fact, be turbidites, which is just what we would expect if these sedimentary rocks were formed by a global-scale flood, that the vast majority of those deposits would have been in, uh, through underwater landslides. We can also point to a number of, uh, of known geologic events that were able to produce strata rapidly. Uh, for example, these layers of rocks you see here near Walla Walla 
are, uh, were formed during the Missoula flood. That's a type of layering called a rhythmite deposit, believed to be due to rhythmic activities like the ebb and uh, ebb and the, the actions at a beach. The ebb and flow of a beach can deposit uh, rhythmic uh, deposits or rhythmite deposits. And that's what these are believed to be due to is uh, some kind of rhythmic activity taking place during the Missoula flood. The eruption of Mount St. Helens, as I mentioned previously, also produced some significant strata. Here there are three separate geological units, all that were formed catastrophically during the initial eruption at Mount St. Helens and subsequent mud flows. The bottom layer uh, from May 18, 1980 is what's called airfall tephra material. That's from the afternoon of the initial eruption. The middle layer was created by what's called a pyroclastic flow, basically a landslide during a volcanic eruption. Very, very hot, very, very nasty uh, and uh, then the upper layer, the, the upper layer formed two years later during a mud flow um, that the deposited layer on the top. The middle layer in particular is very interesting. Look at it here. And remember that we're taught to, in geology that individual layers like this take a long period, time period to form. But here you see a deposit more than 25 feet in thickness containing upwards of 100 separate layers that accumulated in just one day during a pyroclastic flow, which again, just is a type of landslide. Fine lamina, only a millimeter in thickness to some more than a meter high formed in just a few seconds. Another powerful piece of evidence to, uh, po that points to a global catastrophe resulting in these strata are the fact that in many mountainous areas, we can see these rock layers that are thousands of feet thick that have been bent and folded without fracturing. How can that happen? You got to ask if they were laid down separately by mil over millions of years and had already hardened. These layers uh, that you see here are in the Zagros Mountains along the southwest coast of Iran. These shown here are, in, are from the Sullivan River area in southern British Columbia. But again, hardened rock layers are brittle. And in, in particular, limestone is hardened by mineral deposits, calcium carbonate, which is, again, what we use to harden concrete. So try bending a slab of concrete like this to see what happens. But, but again, if concrete is still wet and pliable, you can bend it. The same principle applies to sedimentary rock layers. They can be bent and folded soon after the sediment has been deposited before the cement uh, you know, hardens, but, uh, but not brittle rocks. You can't get brittle rocks, so ancient rocks like this, to fold in this way. Polystrate fossils are another example of rapid strata formation. Many polystrate trees, uh, trees that pass through multiple layers of strata, have been found that span multiple air, air, layers. And it's just not possible for fossils to be buried gradually over many thousands or hundreds of thousands of years due to the speed of decomposition. S during slow, uniformitarian type burial, the top, of, top part of the tree would rot away before it could be protected by sediments. Polystrate trees like these are a uh, uh, point to one thing, and that's the certainty of rapid burial. Now let's revisit the law of superposition just one more time and evaluate it against some experimental results. Now again, this law states that the oldest strata lies on the bottom with younger layers above. But this law of stratigraphy has been shown experimentally to not be true in certain types of depositional environments such as when sediments are flowing. Now, laboratory flumes, the one, like the one I showed you previously, are used to simulate erosion and deposition environments and thus explore the factors that are influencing these processes, including uh, strata formation. Large-scale flume experiments like, uh, were conducted at the Fort Collins Hydrologic Laboratory at Colorado State University with Professor of Hydrolog Hy Hydraulics and Sedimentology Pierre Julian, and the work on this was published in the Journal of Creation back in uh, April of 1988. In these laboratory flumes, they observed stratified sediments forming in minutes to hours under simulated conditions. Heterogeneous mixtures of particles of different sizes and densities were used to determine how these particles would behave in various depositional environments. What they did was they mixed sand, limestone, and coal 
that had different colors to help with the visualization. And uh, what, they, what, they, what it demonstrated was that both fine lamina and thick beds would form during lateral motion. Fine particles would fall between coarse particles, and the coarse particles would roll across the fine particles, causing different layers to form simultaneously. They didn't form sequentially, but these layers formed simultaneously as these sediments were flowing. And perhaps one thing that was most interesting about this, I don't know how well this video captures it, but what they found was, uh, again, with the two particles that you see here, you have a darker sand and mixed with coal, and then the white layer is the limestone that they mixed in there with it. And it was separated out into two layers. But what, they, what would happen if they changed the rate of the flow of the water, another pair of layers, another black and white pair of layers would start forming on top of the previous pair if they change the rate of the flow. So if they increase the rate of the flow or decrease the rate of the flow, another pair of layers would start forming on top. And if they change the rate again, another pair of layers would start forming on top. But all of those pairs of layers would keep developing in a prograding manner. Every time they change the rate of the flow, another pair would start forming, and, but all of them would continue to form in a prograding manner. So what these experiments showed is that when sediments are flowing, the law of superposition just does not hold true. Fine particles, again, would fall between coarse particles, and the coarse particles would roll across, the fine particles becoming embedded in the layer beneath. And more importantly, as this uh, diagram tries to show, the time sequence relationship of the strata is much less bottom to top, as is argued by the law of superposition, but is instead more front to back in the direction of the flow, with the newer sediments being on the forward end of the flow. Now, on the top, but in the forward end. It's very interesting. A cross-section of the sediments from these experiments reveals the significance of the types of layers that are produced by laterally flowing sediments. Watch here as this researcher cuts through the accumulated sediments to reveal strata that formed rapidly. Again, both fine lamina and thick beds of sediments you can see there, including a thick layer of white limestone. That's limestone. That white layer is white limestone. Strata simply doesn't require changes in depositional environment. Remember, they argue that limestone formed when the oceans inundated the continents, depositing the, you know, these, uh, the, these fragments of uh, the exoskeleton fragments of uh, shellfish. So let me kind of change subjects just a little bit and ask this question, what do fossils really show? I believe that the geology is clear that uh, what you're looking at is the result of a major catastrophic flood. But again, fossils are used by evolutionists today as their main supporting evidence. But what, does, what do fossils really show? Well, sedimentary rocks blanket the entire earth. Again, except where uplift and erosion has removed this layer, the earth is covered in monumental layers of sedimentary rock. Fossil beds that are thousands of feet thick in some places. However, we do not see sediments forming like that today. We see sediments forming in little local deposits, such as when, when a river uh, lays down its, uh, its uh, load, in, forming a river delta. When a river slows, the sediments that it's carrying will be deposited when it enters a larger body of water, producing a river delta. We don't see sediments forming like this today. So if the present is truly the key to the past, as Lyle argued, our observations only find local deposits of sediments forming. The fossil records suggest a worldwide catastrophic depositional event. We find ocean fossils on the tops of every mountain train in the world. We find ocean fossils everywhere, not just on the top of every mountain chain, but in every single layer of the fossil record, we find abundant ocean fossils. This proves that the ocean inundated the continent but that it didn't just uh, do so once during geologic history, we can find ocean fossils in every single period of the geological column. The, uh, unlike this diagram that you typically see to illustrate the fossil evidence for evolution, what the fossil record truly is, is a record of ocean deposits. It's a, I mean, it's just full of clams. You could, you could call the fossil record a record of clams because it's blooming what it seemed like most of fossil record is, record of clams. 95% of all fossils in the fossil record are marine invertebrates, primarily shellfish. 95% of the remaining 5% are plants. 95% of the rest are fish. Most of the rest are insects. 
Much less than 1% of the fossils in the fossil record are in fact land vertebrates. It's a record of a monumental global scale flood. Not the history of life on earth over hundreds of millions of years, that's what it is. There's lots of evidence from the fossil record to speak to this event. We find fossils of, with soft tissues. Soft tissues just should not survive any kind of fossilization process due to the rapid speed of decomposition. But we find lots and lots of soft tissues. Um, fleshy parts, skin, cartilage. We find unborn fetuses. Stomach contents have been used to identify what fossils have eaten. The number of soft tissues that have been discovered at this point in time uh, is just enormous and ranges beyond 100 million years. We, in fact, find dinosaur bones that aren't even mineralized. This is a dinosaur bone that's on exhibit in, uh, at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. That's real bone. It's not rock. It's real dinosaur bone. The, the, on, the, on the caption, it says, this is real dinosaur bone from the hind foot of a, a type of hadrosaur. Although it is 69 million years old, it is still original bone and not rock. It's not 69 million years old. It was an animal that died during the global flood, a recent global scale catastrophe. We also find that, that the vast majority of the fossils could be categorized this way, but we find lots and lots of fossils that are identical to living animals. Identical. Plants and animals both. Lots and lots of fossils are categorized as living fossils because they're identical to animals we find alive today. Life on Earth hasn't changed through time. It's They've just interpreted the fossil record incorrectly. We find the same animals alive today that we find in the fossil record. And we find fossils in massive graveyards. This is just a typical characteristic of the fossil record, that organisms are often found in mass. Whole communities of organisms are found buried together. I mentioned the Morrison Formation previously, where you find the Dinosaur National Monument. Thousands of dinosaurs are found buried together in one massive formation. Up in, uh, up in Canada, they found a, a 10,000 centrosauruses buried in one formation, a type of a ceratops dinosaur. Uh, this is such a general characteristic of the fossil record. But again, fossils are used to, to prove evolution. They use these diagrams and try to argue that the fossils show that life on Earth has changed over time from simple to complex forms. We would acknowledge that there are different fossils found in different layers. Again, our interpretation of this is that what you're looking at is this, 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 just the destruction of successive habitats during the flood. The fact that there are different fossils in different layers, though, doesn't prove evolution. What, an, what they must be able to show through the fossil record is that an organism changed through time by way of fossil forms. Can they show an organism that changes slowly and gradually from one form to another by way of fossil forms? The answer to this is no. Now, I want you to understand something, that uh, Darwin himself did not did, wasn't, didn't invent evolution. There were many people during Darwin's time who believed in evolution. Um, he, though, proposed something a little different. He, uh, he was himself a, uh, an accomplished breeder of pigeons and was well familiar with how different breeds of animals had been created slowly and gradually through selective breeding processes. And he argued that the same process was happening in nature. And if that same process was responsible for the changing of animals in nature, then it was a slow and gradual process. Most of the evolutions of Darwin's day held to a process called saltation. They believed that evolution occurred in rapid jumps because when they looked around at living populations, they saw distinct groups. You got a whole bunch of turtles and a whole bunch of lizards and a whole bunch of snakes, but you don't see turtles and that gradually change into, rept into lizards and then lizards that gradually change into reptiles. For all the animals that you can think of, there are distinct groups of animals. And at least of the fossils they knew of in Darwin's time, they also just knew of those distinct groups. But Darwin assumed that other animals had lived, that these distinct groups were just due to extinctions. And he predicted, and it actually gives a carefully worded apology in his 1859 book, On the Origin of Species, that he can't point to fossils to prove this theory that life slowly and gradually evolved through this natural selection process. But he argued that, uh, he uh, predicted that the fossils would eventually be found. 
He acknowledged that groups of animals exist in, in living populations, but he, uh, he argued that uh, this slow and gradual process would have produced animals, it did produce animals in the past, they're just extinct today, but he predicted they would be found in the fossil record. And uh, so, but uh, here we are 150 years later, and uh, they're no better able to, sh to illustrate this process. The fact that Darwin couldn't point to fossils uh, gave him great concerns. So what we see are these distinct groups. And, and uh, since Darwin published The Origin of Species and predicted that fossils would eventually be found, literally here we are 150 years later, and they're no better able to fill in these gaps. These missing links are real, and they're monumental. To illustrate how significant this, this is, I mean, I've just given you four examples of invertebrates here. There are multiple invertebrate phyla, like the, the, the cnidarians represented here by the jellyfish, the echinoderms, like your, is your starfish, your, your mollusks uh, represented by the clams, or your arthropods. There are multiple invertebrate phyla that are about as distinct from each other as you can possibly be. And there's just no indication what evolved into the first cnidarian. There's no animal that, have, that is in the fossil record that was in the process of evolving into a cnidarian or into an echinoderm or into a mollusk or into an arthropod. When these animals first appear in the fossil record, they just pop, pop into the fossil record out of nowhere, perfectly formed, most, most of them identical to the ones we still find alive today. And there's just no indication what did a cnidarian evolved into a cnidarian and a cnidarian mollusk? If Darwin's theory is true, there should be an imperceptible blend of one type as it gradually evolved into another type and another type and another type. But they're as just distinct from one another as they can possibly be. The gaps between organisms are real and they are massive. We're talking about massive gaps in the fossil records. And that evolutionists don't acknowledge this is, is very troubling because it's, uh, it's a very stark fact of uh, paleontology. Stephen Jay Gould arguably is one of the most famous paleontologists of our day. I say this because uh, he was featured on an episode of The Simpsons, you know, and I, I think that's a claim to fame for any scientist if you're on the episode of The Simpsons, at a cameo on the episode of The Simpsons. Anyway, Stephen Jay Gould said that the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as a trade secret in paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks, he says, have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. We simply cannot point to fossils to fill out Darwin's tree of life. He assumed that we would, that the groups of animals that are alive today would be connected together by fossil forms. But the fossils that we find in the fossil record are, by and large, the same animals we find alive today. And some of them are just identical. You don't see the change. The, they're living fossils. They're the same animals we find alive today. And again, when they first appear in the fossil record, they just pop out of nowhere. They just, boom, suddenly appear in the fossil record. And the best and evidence of this or in, uh, illustration of this is an evolutionary event that is called the Cambrian explosion. This... Evo this geologic or evolutionary event is calls, cause, called an explosion because at one point in time, life just suddenly, boom, appears on, this, on the scene. It's called Evolution's Big Bang in this Time Magazine article. The Cambrian explosion is what they call the sudden appearance of life in that one geologic period we call the Cambrian. There's, before the Cambrian, there's just bacteria, bacteria and bacteria and bacteria. And actually, the origin of life gets, gets, is being, getting pushed further and further and further back because as they dig deeper into geologic strata and as they analyze these geologic rocks, they keep finding bacteria. At this point in time, the origin of life has been pushed all the way back to like 3.9 billion years. They believe the, or, the Earth is 4.6 billion years old and the origin of life is now pushed back all the way to 3.9 billion years old. But... At one point in time, there's nothing but bacteria, bacteria, bacteria for billions of years, and then suddenly out of nowhere, boom, during this Cambrian period, all of the major invertebrate phyla just suddenly appear, most of them, and they appear fully formed. Out of nowhere, these things just suddenly pop into existence. But that's the case for the vast majority of animals we find alive today. Highly specialized animals, the flying animals, uh, uh, animals like bats or pterosaurs or birds or insects, all of your flying forms, the first time they appear in the fossil record, they just appear out of nowhere. 
There's no indication what evolved into the first bat, what evolved into the first pterosaur, like your pterodactyls. The first time they find a pterodactyl, it's a perfectly, for perfectly formed pterodactyl. The first time we find a bat, it's a perfectly formed bat. These animals just appear in the fossil record out of nowhere. Darwin's tree of life, as uh, he drew, he drew a tree of life like this. That's what it's affectionately called by evolutionists. They call it the tree of life, the phylogenetic tree. But where did they get the term tree of life? That's from the Bible, right? So that's how they use our biblical terms, a tree of life. But Darwin's tree of life, as he envisioned it, starting off with just that one ancestral cell, eventually evolving into multiple uh, life forms on earth, is just not illustrated by way of the fossil record. What we see is a sudden and rapid, abrupt appearance of life on earth. Life appears out of nowhere. Most of the invertebrate phyla just suddenly pop into existence, and many of them are identical to ones we still find alive today. So let me summarize what the uh, evidence really shows, whether, the fossil, whether geology and the fossils actually prove evolution or whether it's uh, more strongly supportive of a biblical flood. Let's look at the evolu evolution side. We see life appearing suddenly in the Cambrian explosion. That argues st strongly against what Darwin asserted, a slow and gradual process like natural selection doesn't give rise to multiple phyla suddenly the way they appear in the fossil record. We see the, a, a overwhelming ab absence of transitional forms. Distinct groups of animals are found both living and in fossil forms. This is not at all what is uh, expected if Darwin's theory is, is true. We see a great number of out-of-place fossils, uh, many animals that are not found in upper layers of the fossil record and were assumed to be extinct for millions of years have been found living, forcing them to completely revise their views on these organisms. And we see a tremendous abundance of living fossils. But what about the biblical flood? We see one of the laws of stratigraphy strongly supporting the biblical flood, the law of lateral continuity. These layers of fossiliferous rock extend forever. Blanket entire regions of continents can be traced for hundreds and in some cases thousands of miles. We see an overwhelming abundance of ocean fossils in the fossil record. We see fossils that are highly preserved, showing almost no sign of decomposition. Soft tissues can be found in many, many. Uh, we also see these mass mortality beds, these fossil graveyards that are a common part of the fossil record. If you look at the overall characteristic of the fossil record, of geology and the fossils, it is, is much more supportive uh, of, a, of the biblical catastrophic flood. Because uh, that's what the fossil record is. I mean, it is a record, but it's not a record of life on earth over hundreds of millions of years. It's a record of a devastating judgment brought about by God. And the reason why it's so important, the reason why upholding these, these historical events in the Bible is so important, I think is, was summarized well by Jesus. Um, he, he actually said two, two different things. That he's, he said, if you believe Moses, you would believe me before he wrote about me. But since you do not believe how Moses, what Moses wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? He also said, I've spoken of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe I speak of heavenly things? Point made in both was that if we can't trust what the Bible says on historical matters, events like the biblical flood, events like the Garden of Eden, how can we trust what it says on spiritual matters like salvation? The Old Testament and the New Testament are part of the same book. If we let events in the Old Testament fall to the fault of fables or myths, if we let these be challenged by scientific claims and those challenges go unanswered, it will cause a person to lose their faith. I, I believe that the theory of evolution is one of the main impediments today that keeps a person from coming to the faith. And it is one of the, the main causes for the loss of faith that we see in particularly amongst young people. Pe young people that grow up in the church, um, get, up into the, get up higher into their education. Out, by the time they're out of high school, they're already starting to doubt the Bible because of historical events like Noah's flood. And uh, by the time they get out of college, many of them have lost their faith. And I, it's because we're not giving them the answers. We, should, we need to give them the answers before the questions come up in their mind. We don't let the doubts start because those festering doubts will, uh, will grow. And uh, I, I believe it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible thing that leads both to a, to a loss of faith in, in, in kids that have grown up in the church and it's an impediment that can keep someone from coming to the faith. That's why apologetics are so important. I don't study these things to uh, 
to bolster my own faith or to strengthen my own faith. I study them so that I can give answers to others, others, others who are struggling. To be a witness today, again, you need to be prepared to answer some questions, you know, uh, because there are a lot of people think evolution has been proven, but often they just have not seen the evidence, have not seen what the evidence really is and, and where the big holes are in that evidence, like transitional forms or the origin of life, or you know, some people think they've proven that we've evolved from apes. Have they looked into those ape men? Have they looked into those the missing links between apes and men? Those are pretty big too. But I think one of the uh, one of the, the most harmful things about them reinterpreting the fossil record, about them reinterpreting these layers of sedimentary rocks, is what because of what these layers of rocks were always meant to be. I mean, we know why God sent the global flood. He sent it because of the wickedness of the human race on earth in those days. And uh, he decided to, to wipe people from the face of the earth and with and the birds and the creatures and but he if he if his purpose was just to wipe out mankind the he could have done it much more cleanly you know could have released a virus and just killed the people and not kill all the plants and animals not destroy the hydrological system not destroy the earth as it was originally created the whole earth was destroyed the system the water cycle that existed before the flood is gone we don't really even know how the earth operated before, but it was devastatingly altered. I guarantee you that. He could have done it much more cleanly. But I believe he did it by, through a global flood because he wanted to leave a monument, a reminder to us of just how much he hates sin. That he did it by way of a flood to leave a monumental reminder. So when we looked at those layers of rocks, when we look at those fossils, when you go to places like Grand Canyon or out to Columbia River Gorge and you see those vast layers of rocks, you're reminded how much God hates sin. By them reinterpreting those layers of rocks, they've taken away this important reminder. And we, should, we shouldn't forget because God's hatred of sin has never changed. The modern church tends to avoid you know, the verses that talk about his hatred of sin and his hatred of sinners. And they emphasize the passages that talk about his love. But his hatred of sin has never changed. The God that destroyed the world by flood, we will stand in front of one day and have to give a reckoning to about why, how, why we lived the way we lived. And I gotta say, I mean, if you wanna debate the point what, whether God's hatred of sin has changed or not, I would argue that his hatred of sin is probably much greater today. Because he sent his son to die for us. And we know that. We know he sent his son to die for us. And then you continue to live in sin. I got to tell you, his hatred of sin is probably much greater today than it was before the flood. We shouldn't forget the God that destroyed the world by flood. We will stand in front of one day and have to give an account for. Him. But just like he provided a plan for Noah to survive the judgment of his day, Remember that he's provided a plan for us too. All we have to do is ask for forgiveness. The penalties for our sins have been paid. All you have to do is ask for forgiveness and repent. Turn from those sins. And uh, forgiveness is there and waiting for us. That's all we have to do. Let me close in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for your word and for the tremendous insight that we have gained from it, Father God, that we know that these events were real and and we, we understand the world that we live on better than most, Father God. We, Father God, uh, give us wisdom. Father God, we want to be a servant for you, Father, but uh, it's difficult understanding the science. It's difficult understanding the arguments that are put at us, Father God. Give us wisdom and help us understand so that we can be a better witness for you, Father God, and embolden us. Give us Give us the confidence, Lord, to speak when the time is there. Give us confidence to testify about the truth of the Bible, the truth of these events, the truth of your creation, the truth of your son, Yeshua, who was sent to pay the penalty for our sin. Give us the confidence to speak, Lord God. Even during a time like this when it's so unpopular to believe in creation, to believe that the earth is young, Father God, embolden us to speak when the time is, is, time is there. Give us confidence, Lord. Help us to be a better witness for you, Father God. 
Well, I pray. Lord, Father God, we uh, just praise you. We glorify and honor you, Father God. We worship you for all that you've done, for all that you've provided, Father. We worship you for your provision, for this wonderful world that we made, you've made for us, Lord. We, uh, we worship you for your grace. We worship you for your mercy. We worship you for your beauty, the beauty that you've put on display for us. We know how beautiful you are because of the beautiful world that you've made for us. We know how loving you are because of all that you provided, Lord God. We praise you and we thank you. We'll glorify and honor you. Thank you, Lord God. We love you so much. In Christ's name, amen. Go with God.